Hey folks, it's a rainy day today in the combo classroom, and I wouldn't be surprised if the rain returns and sends us indoors soon. But for now, we're gonna start out here in the classroom where all of the clocks are, because today we're gonna learn about a clock-like formula that you can run numbers through. And by numbers today, again, we're just gonna be talking about whole positive numbers. Now this test, this test, when you run a number through the formula, tells you whether or not it's a prime number. If and only if it's a prime number, it can be said to pass the test. And there's only three numbers discovered by humanity that can be said to pass this test sort of twice. And those are 513 and 563. This formula relates to factorials, which we've seen in episodes before, which means that you multiply all the numbers between one and some target number. And we've actually seen a relationship between factorials and primes before, where if you look at a large factorial, n factorial way up there on the number line, well, although the numbers right next to it, one greater and one less than it, could theoretically be prime numbers, nicknamed factorial primes, the numbers two away from this factorial must be divisible by two, like the factorial itself is, because that's even and every other number must be. And similarly, that's three even, so those are three even. That's a multiple of four, so those are multiples of four. And you get a large area near the factorial that must be composite and can't contain primes. So factorials have already showed us some interesting relationships with primes, but this just tells us that primes must have big gaps between them at some point. It doesn't tell us a test for a given random number, whether that random number is prime, which sounds too good to be true, because there's still a lot of mystery as to how the primes are scattered on the number line. And the problem with the formula we're going to see is that it's too inefficient to use on a large number to test it, because factorials get big fast. But although this formula is inefficient, it uses factorials and the modular arithmetic that's similar to how clocks work to be a fully accurate test that if you had a good enough computer could tell you if any random number was prime or not. Clocks are both similar to modular arithmetic because they only have a certain amount of numbers before they spin around and hit the same numbers again. And the number on top of a typical 12 hour clock is a 12 as you're used to, but it really should be a zero. Now here's a 12 hour clock written that way where we have all the numbers you're used to except the 12s replaced by a zero. And here are some clocks with slightly less hours. An 11 hour clock that ranges from zero to 10, a 10 hour clock that ranges from zero to nine, and a nine hour clock, an eight hour clock, and seven hour clock made similarly. Well, what if I asked a seemingly random question, which was on each of these clocks, if I started on top at the zero, the one that you're used to being like a noon or a midnight on this 12 hour clock, and I went forward an amount of hours that was the factorial of the largest number we see on the clock, the number one less than the amount of hours, 11 on this 12 hour clock, well, if I went for the factorial of that number on the clock, where would I end up? I've circled the hour on each of these clocks we would land on if we played that game. On a 12 hour clock, if we started at that zero and added 11 factorial hours, which is a very large number, we'd end up back on the zero. On an 11 hour clock, if we added 10 factorial hours, starting from the zero, we'd end up on the 10. 
on the 10 hour clock and the nine hour clock and the eight hour clock, if we went forward the factorial of the largest number we see, which is the number one less than the total amount of hours, we would end up back on the zero we started on. But on the seven hour clock, if we started on the zero and added six factorial hours, we'd end up on the six. What's different about this clock and that clock that made them not land on zeros? Well, seven hours and 11 hours, seven and 11 are the prime numbers in this range. Now, before we look at any more examples, so I won't have to draw any more clocks, why don't we turn this into modular arithmetic language? Here we can say we were in a zone called mod 12, where all numbers are turned into the remainder they would have if we divided by 12. And we found that 11 factorial was congruent to, sort of the modular equals, zero in mod 12. Now, that's pretty similar to all these cases where we found that some n minus one factorial, n being the mod number or total amount of hours, n minus one being that largest number we'll see there that's not a zero, was congruent to zero in mod n. That was true on these composite cases. But on this one here, we found that 10 factorial was congruent to 10 in mod 11. And we could also write that as 10 factorial is congruent to negative one in that mod, because in mod 11, negative one is sort of like a counterclockwise tick from zero, the number that falls one before the mod number. And so calling it congruent to negative one in that mod will be useful because that makes it more similar to this other prime example where we found that six factorial was congruent to negative one in mod seven because in mod seven negative one turns to six we could also write both of those cases as that n minus one factorial way similar to that but in this case they were congruent to negative one in mod n as opposed to congruent to zero all right, it is starting to rain out here again, so let's head to the porch where there's a little more shelter. I'll grab some whiteboards so we have enough supplies. Uh, here, Carla, can you take these yeah. ones? a chart of all the whole numbers, two upward, up through I went to 15, and the number one under them but factorial, like for five as my n, one under that but factorial is four factorial, 24. And here that factorial is in the mod of the original number, like 24 in mod five is four, also known as negative one in that mod, or five factorial in mod six is zero, meaning that if we spun that many hours on that clock, we would end up back at the top, and also meaning that that factorial is divisible by the number. And so we can notice here that all the composites seem to end up at zero for any composite number, except for four, which stands out. It ends up at two if we were to spin three factorial hours on the four hour clock. Why is four different? Well, let's see what's up with the composite numbers. Hello. Let's say we have a composite number greater than four. Well, the fact that it's composite means we can write it as some smaller numbers multiplied together, either two different numbers we can call a times b, or in the chance that this number is the square of a prime, or the numbers we said in last episode had a prime signature of just two, then it can be written in the form of p squared. 
Well, this A times B must both be smaller numbers, meaning they are contained in that set of numbers we multiplied in the factorial. And in the case of a P squared, we just need P and 2P to show up in that list of numbers multiplying in the factorial. And that'll give us two P's as total factors in the factorial number to be able to divide P squared. So as long as N minus one factorial is big enough to contain P and 2P, or to contain this A times B of two different numbers, then it will be divisible, meaning that in that mod, it'll be congruent to zero with no remainder. And four is the only small enough composite number that three factorial, the one one smaller than it, one times two times three, does contain one of the primes that makes up four, which is two squared, but doesn't contain that 2p. It's slightly out of range, so it doesn't get another factor of two to be able to divide that whole p squared or four. So four happens to be small enough that the number one under it factorial can't divide it and happens to leave a remainder of two. But with any larger composite, due to having to be in one of these forms, there's going to be a zero remainder when that number one under it is taken to the factorial and checked for essentially divisibility. So we can kind of verify that apart from four, which is an exception, all of the composite numbers will end up with zero. So it's pretty easy to prove that for any composite number n, n minus one factorial in mod n will be congruent to zero, except when n is four, which is too small to follow the usual patterns, so it ends up congruent to two. Now that also means in a more instinctual way of describing it, that for any composite number, if you multiply all the integers up through one less than that number, it's divisible by that composite number. But what about the cases where n is a prime number and not a composite? Well, on this list, all of the examples, when we put them into that formula, ended up congruent to the number one less than that prime we input, meaning we could call them congruent to negative one in each of those given mods. And while the proof is a little more detailed, and I'm not gonna put the proof in this episode, it is true that for any prime number, when we do that formula, we'll end up congruent to negative one in that mod. And since any whole number greater than one is either composite or prime, this is basically an on or off switch, a detector for whether a number is prime or not. Although factorials are big, so it would take a lot of computational power, if I wondered if something like 101 is prime, well, I could take 100 factorial, test if that can divide 101, or test what it is in mod 101, and see if we end up at zero being divisible, or end up one behind congruent to negative one. And that would tell me if the number is prime or composite. This bottom result is known as Wilson's theorem, often stated in terms of if n is a whole number greater than one, it'll be a prime if and only if this identity holds. That if we multiply all of the whole numbers between one and one less than the prime and look at its result in the mod of the prime, or basically the remainder if we were to divide by the prime, we kind of get a remainder of negative one. It ends up congruent to the number one less than the prime. Now, if this is a test of sorts, that we could take this factorial, try and divide by the prime in a way, and see what the remainder is to see if a number's prime, are there any prime numbers that could sort of run through that test twice? Which is my casual way of saying, 
could we take a prime number? And if we take the factorial of one less than it, like before, but look at the result in mod of the prime squared, because a prime squared, if we're looking at dividing by that, is sort of like dividing by the prime twice and still get a result that was congruent to negative one. Well, there are three primes discovered with this property that 5, 13, and 563 that I showed earlier. This type of prime number is known as a Wilson prime because it's like it follows a next level version of the congruence that was known as Wilson's theorem that holds true for all prime numbers. And although these Wilson primes that follow that congruence too are very rare, these are the only three discovered by humanity and more than a trillion numbers have been checked. It is conjectured that there's likely to be an infinite amount of them, just really rare. And as for if you could have an even further level of the iteration, where you add a p cubed in there and a prime that followed that congruence, that's unknown to mathematicians. We don't know if that's possible. And I love how all of this is sort of a link between factorials, prime numbers, and this modular arithmetic type of mechanism that works similar that works similar to like a clock, uh, to like a clock. All right, it did stop raining, so we, go. so we can gather this stuff again and head back to the combo classroom for a little finale. All right, where should I? Oh, whatever, it's that one. We're almost at the end of the grade. Sometimes you need some chaos to learn. All right, folks, thanks for joining me here in combo class to learn about a cool link between factorials, a prime detector formula, and the clock-like modular arithmetic. I'll see you next lesson and have an awesome day.